lot of information, but we wanted to at least present some of our important learnings. Anavok, the Vice Chair of the Mini Development Trust, up to say a few words. Very warm namaste and greetings to everyone. My special greetings to Mr. Michael Croft, the Country Director of UNESCO, the Joint Secretary of our Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Civil Aviation, Dr. Suresh Srestazu, our veteran archaeologist, Mr. Kosh Prashad Acharya, sir, my distinguished offices and colleagues from Ministry, from Department of Archaeology, UNESCO team, and everyone here. I'm afraid I have been given a, a very terrible burden to, to point out the future with compassion. Oh, this is a tricky one. <laughs> As we stand on the premise of this chaotic world, I'm afraid that I have no good news. Future does not look very peaceful. <laughs> I think Buddhism it teaches that we can only open to the truth. Congratulate UNESCO team. Mr. Michael Croft came to the venue discussing that this will be the 50th year of World Heritage Convention. And for many also, it's a very special milestone we have actually reached 25th year of nomination as a World Heritage property. So we started conspiring. And it's good when professional bureaucrats and monastics, they start conspiring. How can we recognize this milestone? I'm actually impressed with all this information and how properly it has been laid out in various categories and how it accommodates all the feedback from various experts. Uh, I'm beginning to see a hope, I'm beginning to see a pattern because it was very difficult. How do we try and come up with something that is very meaningful, that is engaging and that could become a motto? And I would like to congratulate you, Michael Craft, because among all the UNESCO offices, I hear that Kathmandu office is actually on the very forefront in leading this agenda. So I am very much impressed. Um, I'm afraid that I do not have the wider knowledge on the various aspects of all the World Heritage properties in Nepal. Our World Heritage properties span all the way from the Mount Everest down to Tarai and the borders to the birthplace of Buddha. But I can share some of my observation in Dubini. And also, past one year, it has given us an opportunity to try and visualize that with the realistic approach under our ministry, under our government, could we find a couple of new ideas for the next 50 years in Dubini. So that's what we have been trying to focus on, looking for the programs within the parameter. First of all, what I have noticed is that the trends are changing very quickly. For example, Suresh Sir knows very well, leading the ministry now, when we started envisioning Lumbini Development Zone, when the UN, uh, UN Government of Nepal worked together to try and envision developing the birthplace of Buddha as an international pilgrimage center, for me, it took me almost a year to dig into documents. What were the correspondences? What were the visualizations? What were the ideas that the early designers like Professor Kim Juthange, various officials at the UN office, especially UNDP office, what were they looking into designing Lumbini as a master plan? At the time, they had envisioned roughly 250,000 people will be arriving in Lumbini. That was the initial calculation. Because this is a formula, an architect has to plan a space for a certain number of people. And they looked at that maybe we'll receive about 250,000 people. And they're actually numbers, suggested study numbers. Japanese come on the top most list. That there will be the most number of Japanese who want to travel to London and visit. And then came Vietnamese, Sri Lankan and so forth. But at the ground reality, 30, 35 years later, now when we look at Lumbini, Every single day, we are receiving more than 8,000 people now in the winter season. 
six to eight thousand people are coming a day, and when I look at the number, Japanese are hardly one or two. These are actually school students coming from India, coming from all over Nepal, coming all the way from Kota, I met them this morning. And it kind of helps us to see how do we present these sites. That we have to change our focus into accommodating all these wider visits from all over the world. From young kid, a school going kid, to the local farmer, to the local devotee, as well as tourists and faithful pilgrims. And this is a monumental task. One of the things we're dealing with in Lumbini now, because fortunately, the government of Nepal has really pushed and has supported the Lumbini Development Trust to complete the Kenzio Tange Master Plan, the physical infrastructure within the next two years. And the work is ongoing. And at this moment, we're studying the solid waste management strategy. It's in its final phase to bit. One of the things we've been looking into is signage. We have to fix the signage. It's a five kilometer long city. People get lost within that area. So how do we organize the signings? And it's not been an easy task. How many languages do we put in? How many signs do we put in? And it made me realize that, well, I had to look into Google Trends. <laughs> so a monk has to use technology sometimes. <laughs> and number one search on Lumbini, they're not looking for my Adobe temple. Attractions around Lumbini. What are the attractions around Lumbini? So they are not coming to the office or going to the information center to get information. They're just Googling from home. So among all these wonderful suggestions, I have become a big fan that perhaps it's time to accommodate and utilize technology to the fullest. There are a few snippets you can say. I think um, UNESCO was also part of it. Um, even there are disabled people who may not be able to try. What's happening there? What is it like? A virtual tour. Even we're imagining a mini museum. Museums nowadays, if, you, if someone can get a real virtual tour, integrated with the main platforms <coughs> like Google and social media, this would be phenomenal. Including Mount Everest, for example. If we could digitally travel. Some Google engineers here went viral, as you know. They shot a, a VR video and somebody flew a drone, and it was such a big thing. Why? Because everyone knows about Everest, but only a very small fraction can actually make it there. So perhaps I would encourage that UNESCO, in the past 50 years, we have been very focused on tangible sites and protecting monuments, which were remarkable. But going forward in the future, the way our world system is growing and changing, a special focus on digital <coughs> interpretation of the site. This would be very vital, very important, and I think it will cover integration of indigenous voices, local languages and all that. We don't have to worry. Now the AI technology is changing in such a way. Google even translates and interprets in Nepali. And we are experimenting with it. Now in the we have these QR codes, no, yes or no. You can scan it, and we have Wi-Fi available for everyone. It can give you audio and, as well as written guided to in seven, eight different languages. And it's functioning very easily. So that I would really encourage. Another thing I, I would emphasize that we have to look at, we have to change our perspective from just protecting the monuments to developing an awareness of those values that created those monuments. Focus on intangible heritage. This we have come to realize from Lumbini. You see, <coughs> from archaeology point of view, from heritage point of view, from development point of view, from tourism and sustainability and growth point of view, all our planning so far has been on how to develop the site, how to protect the archaeological monuments, how to study and interpret them. But the main engine that drives the whole thing, the world focus on the site, it has nothing to do with the development of site. When pilgrims from all the way from Japan or senior lady all the way from Sri Lanka is coming, she doesn't want to see or is not expecting to see a brand new place. What they're expecting to see is a connection with the history of Buddha, connection with the story of the site. 
What I'm trying to say is that these intangible interpretations of the site, they hold much more value in the mind and hearts of people. This is very valuable for us, in Lumbini especially. Though we have to still formulate these ideas into concrete form, we have to work with our ministry to make it into proper policies, but we are beginning to see that we are reaching a milestone in Lumbini when the master plan is completed, and then the government will have an opportunity to re-envision as we are preparing to enlist the Laura Court, Kapila Vastu, as the next World Heritage property. And we have Rama Grama on the tentative list. We are looking at a broader, broader approach. So in Lumbini, in next 50, we are envisioning moving away from individual sites to including the greater Lumbini area. By greater Lumbini area, we mean all the way from Kapilavastu to birthplace of Buddha to Kulia Kingdom of Devadaha and Ramagrama. In Buddhist mindset, they are one landscape. Past 40 years, our focus has been on protecting one specific site. And we did not put control, we didn't study the wider landscape. We didn't see that the forests and the rivers that have been meandering through these sites, that these were part of uh, Buddhist interpretation. I had the privilege to host an 85-year-old Burmese monk from Myanmar. Just, he left yesterday. And I had been touring him for three days. He's a very senior, he's like one of the top, top monks in Myanmar right now. An 85-year-old, and he has been studying about Lumbini and Tilaura Code and everything. And he knows things that even I do not know. And he asked me that, okay, Mita, you have to personally take me around. So three days I have been going. Initially I thought, so it would be, it's not a big deal, okay, I can make one day. We are imagining that next 50 years, we want to propose properly connected, diverse, and sustainable greater Lumbini area. That's our target. Uh, number two, what we're hoping is that perhaps UNESCO and us, we can join. That almost 45 years have been passed, so it's, uh, since the inception of the Mini Kenju target plan. So next few years, we'll have opportunity to re envision what to do in Lumbini after master plan, post master plan thinking. One of the ideas we have talked about is that Lumbini had a 17 nations international committee for development of Lumbini. Michael Kraft and we have been discussing that this is another soft power of Lumbini. So we hope that in future we have an Utant auditorium planned in the master plan. We can convert it into an international peace dialogue center. This could be the new face of Lumbini from tourism to a uh, dialogue center. This is a wonderful possibility and we would love to explore this in future through our ministry, through UNESCO, that this is a wonderful possibility to turn these sites where all the dialogues takes place. Another I have realized is that as the areas and the aspects of heritage <coughs> reservations, their nuances are so complicated, one or two single authorities cannot tackle it. In Nepal, as we are transitioning, I see a need to transfer our skills, our knowledge, and share the responsibility with local development authorities. This has to occur. This is a remarkable change in the Nepalese governing structure that government of Nepal has transferred majority of power to the local development authorities. And the progress is phenomenal. The changes that's occurring in the villages, in the rural area, infrastructure, road, irrigation is wonderful, accelerated. But it's high time to hand over and share some of the burden that, okay, this is a common heritage, it's within your area, can we develop it sustainably? So I think our challenge in the future would be agencies for so far, like Department of Archaeology, LDT, Ministry, we struggle because the resources are very limited, staffing is very limited, and next challenge would be to really develop the modalities to develop the framework, how do we share the responsibility. This will make a big difference. And the third, I would add, is that we must link heritage conservation with sustainable development agendas. And we have to find it, how to integrate it, that this cannot work on its own. 
With this, I look forward to working in a very close collaboration and also for our team, we'll be organizing a few workshops to refine further the ideas of Lumbini in the next 50 years. And we have our own stakeholders to reach out to, but under our ministry, we'd love to work with UNESCO. Finally, I'm glad to congratulate you for really shaping this idea, to initiating this dialogue. How can we reinvent the heritage conservation into a broader discussion? So with these words, um, of course, he'd asked me about peace and compassion. I do hope to invite you someday. Uh, please come to London. Uh, we can do retreats. Even discussions like this, we can combine with the meditation retreat. That we can call it Meditations on Heritage. So that you have an open invitation to. So with these words, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Venerable, for your wise words and for elaborating on um, um, your own thoughts on how we can move to the future. Um, as you know, we've worked with um, many schools and many students with the, the next 50